Welcome to Money Talk with Karen Ricketts, presented by Ricketts, Ricketts & Associates, 3245 North Adrian Highway, Suite L. The opinions voiced on Money Talk are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial, or tax advisor prior to investing. Securities are offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA SIPC. Aaron's back with us in the studio. Hey, Aaron. Hi, John. Well, we finally made it. We got a new one. <laughs> we rolled it over. <laughs> 2020's here. Yes. I don't know what's going to do for our foresight or our hindsight, but mm -hmm. we got mm -hmm. it. <laughs> well, for markets, it was a good year. Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. The economy was okay. Jobs were okay. There's a lot of good things that happened in 2019. So one thing I say is, uh, and I talked to a colleague just uh, this week, it might sound silly to most, but, you know, in our business, we do a lot of uh, age calculations, you know, just quickly when somebody gives you their birth date or we have to, you know, make sure that, you know, as uh, certain special dates come, you know, 59 and a half, maybe 62, full retirement age. Uh, 70 or 70 and a half, you know, for different reasons, we have to calculate uh, people's ages from a birth date. And sometimes uh, you'd rather have an even number to start with. So 2020 oh, is right. finally here. So, you know, 2000 or 2010, but um, 2020 is another good year. So if somebody's born a certain year, you know, all you got to do is just figure it out to 2000 and add 20. It yeah, might right. sound silly, but... Sometimes you want to get it done real quick. And uh, when you had 19 in your head, it was kind of hard to get there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it sounded silly, but that's how it is. Sorry for the uh, cold or the voice here. I've uh, been battling that for a, a few weeks here. But. I, I think a lot of people are doing that. So yeah, they, yeah. Sounds just, like me. He sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like Aaron. <laughs> Who is that guy? All right, let's talk about uh, uh, the year 2019. And yep. we, uh, I'm sorry, a yearly economic update, I guess, uh, the year end recap. How's that? So stocks reached their highs in 2019 ever, highest ever, uh, the S&P 500. And I say this a lot, but it's a standard in poor. It's just the indice that uh, has been, um, uh, that takes the top 500 companies that are out there and uh, does uh, a formula and creates a number. So it's uh, probably what most of us advisors use as the benchmark or what I call the uh, moderate uh, portfolio, moderate uh, risk portfolio. So the S&P 500 climbed above 3,000 for the first time in 2019 and near 30% returns for the year. Uh, it, and I wouldn't say that's shocking, but it is uh, interesting to see that uh, number come, especially from last year's uh, conversation or 2018's conversation leading into 19. But uh, more numbers, the Dow uh, Industrials, which is 30 companies or 30 stocks, uh, finished the year about 22%. And the NASDAQ composite, which is the 100 uh, tech companies, typically the te tech companies, they have other companies on there, but that's... Uh, makes up a lot of their uh, companies is 35% for the year. The uh, uh, Europe and Far East index, so international or foreign, was up about 18% for the year. So, of course, very, very good numbers. I know people that uh, look at their investment statements and uh, if they're invested properly or uh, taking a bit of uh, enough risk where they're using uh, stocks in their portfolio, they probably saw or had a pretty good year. Now, you know, those numbers I gave you for the S&P 500 and the Dow, remember that's pure stock. So there's a lot of risk in there when you do that. It makes sense when you're younger, you should be more heavy in the stock side. And when you're older, most likely if you're using uh, some of that money, taking it as income, you're not contributing anymore. You want to be uh, less in the stock and uh, have some at least uh, bonds and cash in your portfolio. Very common uh, you know, a uh, conversation that we have with our clients and most advisors do. But I, I mentioned all that just to, you know, don't 
don't be terribly concerned if you only got 25% in your portfolio. You got to look at how much risk you're taking and um, how much the uh, the underlying uh, performance of that those stocks or bonds and cash that you have, what's the underlying performance of those in comparison maybe to the SP500 or the Dow, whatever that uh, benchmark is. So I've said this uh uh, on the program many times and my dad uh, often talked about it years ago as you know it's so important to have a good balance to be well diversified in your portfolio but you can be over diversified and uh, I see that more and more uh, nowadays uh, with these uh, portfolio uh, creators that are out there that uh, you, somebody in their portfolio or will have a mutual fund or ETF or even individual stock portfolio, and they'll have upwards of 25 to 35 uh, of those mutual funds, stocks, or ETFs. And sometimes you can over-diversify. Now, you know, good people in this business argue, I just want to make sure that people understand it's mostly about the risk. How much risk are you taking or are you willing to take uh, to get that that return that you think is appropriate for your portfolio and what your needs are. So I just caution with those numbers I just gave you, you know, even if you're half that uh, number in your, uh, your, your overall returns for the year, maybe that was appropriate for you. Other things that happened this last year, the Federal Reserve eased the uh, benchmark interest rates. And that's a very complicated subject, and I've uh, actually read and studied as much as I can on this, so I I can tell you that it's still complicated, <laughs> and I still uh, struggle with it to see exactly how it all works. But it is well known that the Federal Reserve has a lot to do with our overall economy, at least on the macro side, the big side of things. So often when they reduce interest rates, Markets do well because it provides more liquidity. It provides more money into the space. And, 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 and when people have more, and I say space, into the economy, when people have more money or investors have more money, and it's not necessarily us guys, you know, it's the businesses, it's the uh, those that are uh, uh, trying to create new business, they will use that money or borrow money at a cheaper rate because if they're lowering interest rates, it's cheaper for banks to loan that out and they put it into the economy. And the whole idea is then for when there's more money to buy stocks, to buy bonds, to buy, it pushes the prices up and makes things, um, I wouldn't say more efficient, but it certainly makes things uh, more, uh, at least the money side of things, people can buy it. It's more available to them. So Federal Reserve easing, or raising interest rates has a great impact overall on our economy over long terms, long periods of time. So the investors, I believe, truly warmed up to this because they have been raising interest rates since 2015. 2015 is when they started and the markets were pretty much flat that year. I mean, we had a, a good rise or run in the market that year, and the, uh, we gave it all back towards the end of the year. And I truly believe it was because Federal Reserve was raising interest rates and reduced money supply. So we, then we get through 16, which was an okay year. We get through 17, which is an okay year. And then they're continuing to slowly raise interest rates. They got to 2018. And then they ramped it up and raised interest rates more. And then last year, the S&P 500 was down 4.5%. So just those last four years, moving into the fifth year, you could see how the Federal Reserve had some, some effect on returns in the market. Because what did they do this year? Uh, I'm sorry, in 2019, they reduced the rate three times, a quarter percent each time. And I think you're seeing the impact of that over, you know, this period. We had a good run up in the market at the beginning of the year. So the first three months, then the next six months were kind of, you know, flat. We had some, you know, uh, up days and, and up weeks and even a month where it went well. But we gave it all back at periods of time. So the beginning of the year and the end of the year is when we got that near 30% gain in the S&P 500. And again, 
another example of why you need to stay invested. You can't time it. If you can time it, you know, you're somebody very, very special. And I haven't met anybody or, you know, there's books out there that say they're, they can do it, but they can't. I've, it just doesn't happen. I mean, is this a good example of how people, I mean, they're trying to track the market, but maybe a much better indicator is just to keep their eye on what the Fed Reserve is doing right with interest rates. That's right. And uh, you can go back and, and look at all the Fed funds. You can do a, a search, a quick Google search will give you what the Fed funds rate and then match that up with what the returns of the market. Was. It doesn't always, you know, work out exactly the same because, you know, in uh, late 2005 and I'm sorry, 15 and I'll get this right, 2005, 6 and 7 leading up to that great recession, right, that started in 2008. The Federal Reserve was looking to, you know, ease the, I'm sorry, to slow down the uh, the amount of money or the, uh, that was available to everybody in the in the uh, economy, so they were raising interest rates. And then when 2008 happened, they lowered rates so fast and so hard we got down to near zero. We're up, you know, over two percent now. But that period of time, uh, it took several years for us to recover. And I don't even think uh, the Federal Reserve could. Uh, um, could imagine or, 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 or try to figure out what was in their best interest. What I think the Federal Reserve has done is they've learned their lessons from the 80s and 90s when, and even in the 2000s, when they were raising interest rates dramatically, like a month, two months, three months, they were raising rates a quarter percent, quarter percent, half percent, even more. And I, it's like a slingshot effect or a boomerang, you know. It would go out and then come back. It would go out and come back. And it was a, a very trying time for um, many in this business or, you know, investors because, you know, it was tough to ride those ups and downs. And they all felt it was based on the Federal Reserve doing what they were doing. Now we often see a lot of politics, you know, are driving markets or, or – uh, conversations or tweets, you know, sometimes push a market up in a day or drive it down in a day. But over long periods of time, we see like this year was pretty amazing. All right. So what else happened last year? Uh, U.S. and China had their, I like my little <laughs> article I'm reading, it's a trade quarrel, <laughs> had their trade quarrel. So my understanding is it's possible that that uh, 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 the agreement, the first phase agreement they're calling it, could be signed in the next week or two, uh, mid to uh, late uh, January. And so they have made some changes even before that uh, lowered tariffs. And uh, they're still going to have tariffs. I think this agreement still holds uh, some tariffs uh, uh, on both sides. But I think we have more tariffs because the Chinese sell more goods to us than we sell to them. Um Earnings beat expectations. We had low expect expectations for the year. So um, more than 75% of companies beat their earnings expectations. That's significant. I always tell everybody it's all about the earnings. If the companies are doing well, your portfolio is most, most likely is going to do well. And then that economy, the overall economy maintained momentum. The gross domestic product uh, in the first quarter was about 3.1%. 2% in the second quarter and 2.1% in the third quarter. And so they are talking about this year being around two. Well, last year they said it'd be around two. So it was a little higher than that. Uh, so again, lots of positive um, uh, information that um, including, including jobs, 180,000 jobs per month through like November last year was the average. That is incredible. An incredible amount of jobs. We're adding a lot of immigrants, uh, this last year was one of the largest uh, years that we uh, had uh, legal immigrants, um, you know, because those are the numbers we know. Uh, well over a million uh, legal immigrants uh, came to the country, and it's been around that number, but it was, you know, sometimes it's fifty to 100,000 less. That's a lot of people and a lot of jobs that we have and, and have needs to fill. Well, you know, if, if people want to get a get a feel for, for what's <laughs> going on or what they – what What's already happened and what may happen. Yes. Yeah, how can they do that? They can give me a call. 265-3540. 
All right, Aaron. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. That's Money Talk with Aaron Ricketts, presented by Ricketts, Ricketts & Associates, 3245 North Adrian Highway, Suite L. The opinions voiced on Money Talk are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Securities are offered through LPL Financial Member FINRA SIPC. Join us once again next week for Money Talk here on 103.9 WLAN.